everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Industry Insiders by Go Away series. Hear stories from industry experts, travelers, explorers, and globetrotters who will inspire you to dream bigger, explore further, and discover a new world. Today, I'd like to welcome Rose Lischitz from the Japanese National Tourism Organization. Uh, did I get that correct? It's the Japan National Tourism Organization. Or what did I say? Japanese. Sorry, Japan yeah. National <laughs> Tourism Organization. Um, and as I was just speaking to Rose off camera, so to speak, I noticed that her surname is not very Japanese sounding. So to get us going, Rose, can you give us a bit of a background on who you are and what is your relationship to the JNTO, please? Sure. Um, so I actually was born and raised right here in Los Angeles, California. Um, so currently I work here as the marketing coordinator at the Los Angeles office. So my role is basically to present about Japan to travel advisors or travelers in general, um, get them really excited to visit, help point them in the right direction um, when they're looking for resources to make that happen. But I actually only just got back here a few years ago. Um, so I lived in Japan for nearly 10 years. Um, yep. I went there as a student um, oh, okay. and, then, and then as a teacher and then as a tour guide and concierge. So I've worn a few different hats um, in my time there. Oh, wow. So you have a really good understanding of uh, Japan at all, all, all levels from living there to being a visitor to everything else. So you mm -hmm. mentioned you were uh, a teacher. Were you teaching English, which seems to yes, be so what a lot of people do? Yep. Yeah. So I was on uh, the JET program, which is a government program to teach um, English. So I was an assistant language teacher um, at municipal uh, elementary schools and junior high schools in Japan. Oh, okay. And you, did you mention you were also a guide in Japan? Yeah. So <laughs> I've done, I've worn a lot of hats. So yeah, yeah. Um, after that I did move, uh, I was in a pretty rural area, not super rural, but a very small city called Okayama. And then after that, I moved to Tokyo, so right to the big city, and yeah. I was an information concierge at an information center, so I was giving tours, doing workshops, uh, interacting with tourists every single day, pointing them in the uh, kind of right direction. So what I do now with JNTO is kind of an expansion of that. Right. I went from a small area in Tokyo to the whole country. Okay, so I would assume with all this experience in Japan that you speak Japanese to some degree? Yes, I am fluent. I've oh, been studying fluent? it since college. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yeah. Is that is that what took you to Japan? Uh, like an interest in it from school time, school age? Yeah, um, I really enjoyed learning the language, and I did a study abroad in Osaka. Mm -hmm. And I know at that point, I I thought, you know, this is something I love to do. I have a passion for the language, so why not go there, live there, see what it's like? And it's really great now because I get to take that passion, kind of translate it to getting other people to go. Okay. So again, just going off subject somewhat, I've always had a fascination with Japan. I've been twice many, many years ago, so I'm nowhere near as up to date as obviously you are. Um, but I'm often asked in my travels, I have traveled extensively. People say, you know, where have you gone? What are your favorite destinations? And when it comes to Asia, I often look always to Japan as a place I would like to go back to. I've traveled somewhat extensively in Asia, Southeast Asia, when I was younger. But it doesn't have the same draw to me as going back to Japan does. In your time in the area, have you also experienced the other Asian countries nearby, be it China, be it Southeast Asia? You know, I didn't really travel that much. It's funny because... As a traveler, you have an opportunity to kind of go around and experience a lot. When you're living and working there, you're really focused <laughs> yeah. on just work. Yeah, so yeah. I'm a little ashamed to say I didn't travel as much as I wanted to, but you know, I would love to do a trip going to Japan, but also um, visiting some of the other countries in the area. That would be a dream. Yeah, because again, I'm jumping ahead of some questions we have here, but um, Japan is also um, a good multi-country well, I shouldn't say Japan, is the yeah. area is a great multi-country and Japan is obviously very well combined with other countries, which we will touch on uh, a bit later on. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I'm going to read from my questions for those who are watching us. As COVID is now on the horizon, um, is there anything globetrotters should need to be aware of in respect to when they are visiting Japan, be it pre or when in country, in regards to COVID mm -hmm. or health issues in general, I guess? 
Mm -hmm. So at the moment, there is no travel advisory issued for Japan. So in terms of entry, it's business as usual. Um, but that said, you know, travelers get worried about that sort of thing. I think it's never a bad idea to check with U.S. embassies in your area to give you the most updated information. You know, I get travel anxiety like that. I just find that, you know, staying in the know is the best medicine for it. Check what mandates are going on, if any. There are none right now in Japan. Um, and just travel with your well-being and the well-being of those around you um, in mind. JNTO's website does try to keep, keep them as up-to-date as possible. So if there's any um, question about travel restrictions, of course, we can point you in the right direction. Right. And uh, Goway also does the same in regards to all our countries, be it COVID or other issues. Um, we're always, you know, hopefully as close to the tip of the, the sword, so to speak, in regards to updating our agent community out there. So um, JNT, I would advise us and we would in turn advise you via Facebook, e-zines, et cetera. But um, as Rose is saying, as of now, everything's open, everything's ready to rock and roll in Japan. Uh, um, <laughs> again, some of these questions may be obvious, but we may have some new agents in the audience out there who may not know any of this. So let's go to the basics. Um, is it easy to get to Japan from North America? Yeah, very easy. So even pre-COVID, we had 19 airports in the U.S. servicing nonstop direct flights to Japan. Um, and since we reopened last spring, these flights have been returning one by one, airline by airline from the West Coast. It's about a 12-hour flight to Japan. So for those who are on the West Coast, it's easier to get to Japan than it is to go to Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'll find that the vast majority of these flights um, will take you into Tokyo. So it's really convenient because most people start their journeys in Tokyo. Um, and then if they do have connections, they can easily make it from uh, Haneda International Airport or Narita as well. Um, and there are actually some direct flights even to places like Osaka, which is more on the western side of Japan. So for people who are more interested in traveling western parts, you have an easy connection um, there as well. It's pretty painless to transfer as well from major hubs if you need to take any domestic flights. Okay. And coming out of Canada, are there direct flights? I know you're not, I, I, I know you're US based, <laughs> but we do have agent, uh, Canadian agents online. Do I, you know? That's something, <laughs> I don't think I know off the top of my head. I feel relatively certain that there are, but I don't want to say anything that I'm not 100% sure of. Okay, well, I can back us up that we are we do have some direct flights out of Vancouver into okay. uh, into Japan as well. So, but in short, it's easy to get to direct flights for the most part. Um, and as we alluded to earlier, if you are looking at combining other Southeast Asian countries or China, there's ways to connect um, from Japan or from those countries into Japan. So, um, simple question: Why should someone look at visiting Japan? I mean, you know what? It's a great question. It's one that travelers ask themselves every time they're making plans for a trip. Um, so personally, I think when people are looking to travel anywhere, there's the obvious facet of, you know, people want to escape somewhere different. Um, but for long haul travelers, there's this additional want to really experience something unique, novel, really memorable for them to take back home with them to treasure. And for a lot of people, Japan really checks those boxes because while it is plenty modern, um, you will find a lot of really meticulously preserved ancient traditions, a lot of natural beauty. People are enchanted not just with the glittering metropolises of mm -hmm. Tokyo and Osaka, but also the hot springs, the landscapes, historical sites, temples, shrines, artisanal crafts, everything that makes a destination um, feel unique. Some areas will make you feel like you've stepped back hundreds or even thousands of years. So you get that novelty, but you also don't have to give up those creature comforts because you do have access um, to those modern amenities. So, yeah, I think one of the things that has always been a pull to me because I, I like my history um, is the very rich and strong culture that Japan has on display. Now, most countries obviously have very rich, proud cultures and histories as well. But to me, anyway, my impression is that it's, yeah, it's really in your face, both old and new. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? No, absolutely. I mean, even if you go around large cities like Tokyo um, and, you know, you're going around Harajuku with all the crazy fashion and the fun shops, right next door to it, you're going to find Meiji Jingu Shrine, which is in this gorgeous forested sort of area. Like, it's like you're stepping into another world. And there's so many places like that in Japan as well. Okay, so 
for people visiting Japan, some other questions would be, um, you obviously are fluent in both languages, English and Japanese. If someone's traveling independent without a guide, um, mm -hmm. is communicating outside of, again, what we'll touch on the golden, uh, the golden route, um, is communicating with locals and or officials or tourist representatives easy outside of the big areas as well? Because I know it's somewhat easy within the biggest Yeah, area. yeah. Yeah, so definitely in any sort of hubs, you'll find um, as Japan was preparing for the Olympics, they really bumped up their English signage everywhere. So all the train stations are much better equipped. Um, and usually you'll find station attendants will have some level of English. Um, obviously, as you're going to more rural areas, you're going to find um, less English available. But that said, I mean, in my experience in Japan, although I'm biased being able to speak Japanese, but, you know, people are just very friendly for the most part, even if they don't know what you're saying. If you can point to something on a map, if they have to, they'll grab your hand and take you there. Um, people tend to be really friendly and accommodating. And nowadays it's also very easy with tools like Google Translate. People course, will just yeah. speak into their phone, hold it up. It makes it a lot more seamless. We're in a very lucky day and age. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but that's a very good point for anyone traveling anywhere where English is not the first language, the old Google Translate. Didn't have that back mm. in my day, but yeah, excellent. So again, in summary, an independent traveler, be it a five-star independent or a budget independent traveler, communicating should not be an issue when looking at Japan, particularly outside of the, the big sites. Um, and on that note, um, can you explain what the golden route is and how, mm -hmm. why it's usually the first general itinerary that people will look at and or do on a visit to Japan? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So the golden route is kind of the standard kind of gold standard route for first timers uh, in Japan. It's suitable for about a week to 10 days, and it's also fully accessible with the bullet train. So the reason it's so popular among first timers is because it really gives you a nice snapshot of Japan. You get a little bit of everything. So it starts off in Tokyo, very convenient since most people fly in there. So that's where you get the big city experience. You enjoy all the tech, the fashion, shopping, pop culture, all of that. Um, then you move on a little bit west to the Mount Fuji area to Hakone. So that's an area that is famous for its hot springs. So you get to kind of catch your breath in nature, soak in those hot springs, get a nice view of Mount Fuji um, after a few days on the go. Um, after that, you move a little more west to Kyoto, so that's where you get your fill of tradition. So it's got 2,000 temples and shrines, as well as 17 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, people enjoy activities like kimono dressing, geisha performances, tea ceremony, all of that. Um, and then just next door to it is Osaka, one of my favorite places. It's kind of considered food essential uh, in Japan. It's known as Japan's Kitchen. Um, so it's a great place to do the local creed, which is kui daore, which means eat till you drop. So I'm a fan of that. Um, lots of really great fried foods, street foods, um, lots of family friendly activities. Um, and then you would end your journey there. So it's just a really nice way to get a rounded out experience of Japan in a very short period of time. Yeah. And generally speaking, that, uh, that itinerary is done off the back of the bullet trains, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, can you point out there's, I believe from memory, there's some way that the um, that excess luggage is transferred while you're doing this. Is that correct? That there's a service that can take large yeah. bags that you're not using while you're doing the stops en route? Yeah, so um, it's pretty easy to do luggage transfers from any hotel actually that you're staying at to make it even easier. So if you've got a lot of luggage, what you can do is go down to your hotel concierge. Most hotels do this. Um, as long as you tell them sort of in the morning and arrange it, you can have them send on your luggage and it'll arrive by the next day to your next stop. Um, so all you have to really do is pack an overnight bag to tide you over. Um, and then you don't have to worry about carrying heavy luggage with you. If you don't do it through the hotel, you can also do it even at convenience stores. Um, there are a lot of ways to transfer. Okay. Good to know. Um, and for go away, uh, itineraries for the most part, uh, the golden route is done with a guide at, um, from start to finish. So there are options to do this particular run with no guide if you want to do it independently or pick up guides along the way. Um, but the guide 
usually speaking will be with you from start to finish and as we've discussed they'll be speaking English obviously um, and are very well versed in naturally the, the local areas. Um, some little things just sticking with the golden route um, we've often been asked can people go to a sumo wrestling match and or a sumo school Mm -hmm. So uh, seeing a match, it does depend on the tournament season. So at different times in the year, um, the sumo wrestlers will be in different cities. Um, so it is kind of trying to hit a moving target in that sense. Um, but if you don't manage to catch a sumo, sumo tournament when it's going on, um, you can visit sumo stables. One of the most popular places to do this is the Ryogoku area in Tokyo. So that's usually like the home base for a lot of sumo wrestlers. So you can go and see a morning practice. Some experiences will even let you um, eat with the sumo wrestlers. You can have mm -hmm. the chonkonabe. So you can dine like a sumo wrestler at the same time. So that's another great experience if you don't happen to come when a tournament is going on. Okay. And sticking with the cultural aspect of it, uh, there are also, excuse my pronunciation if I get it wrong, as an accommodation choice, you can stay at um, you can stay at a ryokan, which is a mm -hmm. traditional Japanese inn, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. And they vary mm -hmm. from budget all the way up to luxury like any hotel would. Yeah, so you can find some really affordable options for ryokan. So um, we usually recommend people stay in one at least one time uh, during their time in Japan. And that's just so you can really get that authentic experience with those beautiful tatami floors. You can sleep on futons. Oftentimes you get access to adjacent hot springs. Um, and for some really lovely ryokan, uh, they have an important word in Japanese is omotenashi. So this kind of means um, hospitality, but there's a sort of deeper implication of it where you're supposed to kind of predict your guests' wants and needs before mm -hmm. they themselves are aware of it, and then you deliver. So um, it's a really great word. It's apt for ryokan service because some of these ryokan will have it so that, you know, you can stay in your room and then you can go have your adjacent hot spring experience in the evening and then when you get back to your room there's a traditional meal just waiting for you your futons are already set up for you um there are a lot of really great levels of that sort of experience it's really lovely Wonderful. for people to enjoy and as you mentioned um and this is what goe recommends as well at least one night if not a couple at a ryokan somewhere in japan and again once you get out of the golden root area i would assume um they are traditional wherever you are, but do they take on a more traditional feel away from the less touristed areas? Yeah, you'll find a lot um, of, yeah, very traditional inns. You'll find a lot of family-owned inns. Even outside of Ryokan, um, there are other kinds of accommodations like Minshuku, which is sort of, I guess, the equivalent of a, of a bed and breakfast. Um, so that's also a great experience where you can kind of stay in these really charming accommodations um, in really rural areas. Um, so you do kind of get that really nice authentic feel when you kind of venture out into the countryside. Okay, so in the summary, when it comes to accommodation, everything from traditional inns, um, be it the more upscale or budget, all the way through to the usual five-star, four-star mm -hmm. hotels, Western-style hotels all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, getting around Japan outside of the bullet trains is obviously um, you can take road transport. Um, is self-driving a big thing for Japan? Um, it's definitely possible to do. Um, so you'll find that some rental cars will even have uh, English GPS, depending. Um, so the only thing, of course, that you need is an international uh, driver's license in order to do it. Um, but you do get a sense of freedom if you do want to visit the more countryside areas that have a bit more scarce public transportation. I have a friend who I think it was just a few months back, he rented a car with his mom. They did a whole road trip around the Japan Alps, staying in these little traditional B&Bs or Minshuku along the way. He had an absolute blast. So if you do want to really get off the beaten path, it's a great option too. And did he speak Japanese or he was a uh, he was an American he, traveling He doesn't Japan? speak Japanese, no. Okay. Um, and, yeah. and he had no issues finding his way around, getting around? So he's been to Japan a few times, so I think he, he's been around the block. He kind of knows how to okay. get his way around. But he doesn't speak the language, so, um, yeah, he just, you know, uses all the tools that yep, are available to us. <laughs> okay, so um, driving's an option, be it um, with a driver and guide, self-driving. Mm -hmm. 
Um, not that you would trek around the entire uh, the entirety of the country, but things like uh, trekking options and or mountain biking or cycling, mm-hmm. are they options within Japan, be it Golden Route and, and or outside the Golden Route? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Japan is a a huge adventure destination for a lot of people. Um, It's interesting because it's a very longitudinal country, right? So you've got areas up north that are subarctic and then areas down south that are subtropical, everything in between. It's an island that's got beautiful coastlines, beautiful biking uh, trails, hiking trails. There are lots of pilgrimages um, that people do. So um, some really popular ones are the Kumano Kodo or the um, Shikoku 88 Temple Pilgrimage, um, which can span for hundreds of kilometers and you can choose to hike or um, walk portions of those as well. Um, it's a very, very good adventure destination. Okay. Is Japan, I know it's not known for it, but are there beach opportunities in Japan? Yes, absolutely. A lot of really beautiful coastlines. Um <laughs> I mean, given it's an island, obviously, there are a lot of (laughs) coastlines, um, but there are some really gorgeous beaches all around the country, for sure. Excellent. Now, I was actually in the Cook Islands recently, and I bumped into an American traveler down there, where we just started to chat, as you do, and he mentioned that he likes exploring the Pacific, which Japan sits within, of course, um, a lot of due to World War II history. So for any Mm -hmm. of our agents who deal with uh, World War II uh, history buffs, and there are a lot of them out there, um, I know Japan obviously was integral in World War II. Mm-hmm. From a North American looking to see some of the history of World War II, is that an option um, from organized tours and getting to some of the um, big sites? Obviously, Hiroshima would be one of the most prominent ones. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Hiroshima is usually the one that, especially for first timers, it's the most accessible place um, because basically it's a golden route extension. You can just hop on the bullet train from Osaka and just keep going to Hiroshima just a few hours out. Um, So lots of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. There's the, um, the Peace Park as well, the Atomic Bomb Dome. Um, So lots of history there. Um, It's a a really, really great sort of um, beautiful area to visit. Also lots of nature in the area. Um, And the city itself is really accessible. Most places that you'd want to go, Um, you can do a hop on hop off bus that goes around Hiroshima Station. Um, So that's usually what we would recommend um, for those who are on the Golden Route who want to kind of learn about history um, and experience it. Um, It's a great addition. Okay, so on that theme of themes for travel, um, we're talking here history and World War II in particular, but if someone was, uh, or one of our agents had a group or an individual who wanted to get into the culinary side of uh, Japan or the, say, fashion textiles side, mm-hmm. music side, so on and so forth, um, I know from a fact, but I'll ask you the question anyway, it's easy to build tours around someone's individual tastes and get them into, say, a textile factory or a school, something similar based on their interests, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so outside of even the Golden Route, I mean, there are 47 prefectures in Japan and all of them have something special about them. Um, But that's what also makes it great for repeat visitors or visitors who have really niche interests. Um, You know, for people who are interested in sports, like I mentioned, they can go snowboarding in Hokkaido, they can go diving in Okinawa. Um, Or they can go, you know, cycling along the coast by the Sea of Japan. Um, Hot spring lovers can visit hot spring towns like Beppu Onsen in Kyushu, where they even steam their local cuisine using hot springs. Mm -hmm. Um, Art lovers can hop around the art islands in the Seto Inland Sea, visit all the museums and exhibits there. Um, Also, lots of crafting opportunities in that area, too. And then, you know, spiritually inclined people can go on those ancient pilgrimages or go to areas like Iseshima that um, are known for their Shinto shrine complexes. Um, So you can really build different itineraries um, based on the client's interests and even just add them as extensions to the Golden Route so you can get the best of both worlds. Yeah, excellent. I was going to ask, uh, I, I didn't know this, and I was going to ask you about diving, but you mentioned you can go diving in um, Okinawa as well. So, yeah, Japan definitely has many things to do. Uh, probably can't squeeze them all on that first visit, but as you yeah. mentioned, it's a perfect segue into that Japan is definitely a multi-timed, I'm not sure if that's the correct English, go back many times type of destination, and each time it could be completely different 
um, yeah. and look and feel. Um, so on that note, and you sort of touched on it there, um, first time visitors, Golden Route, Tokyo to uh, Osaka, generally speaking, um, adding on Hiroshima is a very common add-on. Actually, mm-hmm. I'm going to jump back to something. Seasons in Japan are quite mm-hmm. different, summer to winter. So without stating the obvious, can you go through when winter is, when summer is, when cherry blossom season is, and you already touched on it, but a bit touch more detail, can you enjoy snow sports in Japan? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Japan is kind of known for the four distinct seasons. Um, so of course, the most popular time to go for people is in spring because they want to see those cherry blossoms. Um, so th- that's a great time to go. It is a very congested time to go because everyone wants to see them, of course. Um, but every season in Japan has something um, really wonderful and unique about it um, culturally. So for example, if you go uh, in the summer, you get to experience summer festivals. There are fireworks uh, displays that often go on during these festivals. Obviously a great time for um, the summer sports, people who want to go rafting and surfing, things like that. Um, And it's also the season where Mount Fuji is open to climb. Um, So a lot of people will aim for that season, usually like late June, early July is when um, it opens up through August. Just to interrupt you, um, do, you need, mm-hmm. do you need any specific skills to climb Mount Fuji? Like, is it a climb or is it more of a extreme trek? I would definitely push it more on the extreme side. You definitely want to be prepared um, to go, make sure you make all the proper arrangements um, when you do do it. But, I mean, it's a great experience, obviously. Um, we were very slammed the last time uh, in the summer because Japan just opened and so many people have been itching to climb Mount <laughs> yes. Fuji for three uh, years so yeah it was very very popular okay so um, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't mean to break your train of thought no down. no it's 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 a great question as well um so that's summer after summer autumn that's my personal favorite time just because that's harvest season in japan so you get a lot of really nice woodsy earthy flavors coming into season a lot of fresh fish um a lot of uh sort of things like mushrooms and sweet potatoes the sweets are out of this world in japan during that time so i'm obviously a little bit biased um, but also the autumn leaves are absolutely gorgeous usually in november is when they turn um and then of course when you go in the winter time, um, it's really, really beautiful. All these illuminations are usually up for around the Christmas season. Um, and of course, as you get into sort of the dead of winter, uh, that's the best time for snowboarders and skiers, um, especially in areas like the Japan Alps. Um, so sort of kind of central Japan, as well as up north in Hokkaido. Niseko is one of the most famous areas for their powder snow. Um, so every season has got uh, something special to offer. Okay. So, again, I just sort of jumped around there in my question list. So let's get back to where I was mm-hmm. heading in that um, you've already made it very clear that there's many things to see and do in Japan, go back multiple times. So once you've done the Golden Route, mm-hmm. what's outside of that? Like, I know we touched on you can art, textiles, diving, but from an area point of view, where should you look at as your second visit and then maybe your third visit? So I would definitely say it depends, again, on interest. A lot of people still want to visit, you know, those spots like Tokyo and Kyoto. Um, But what I often recommend people is if, you know, they don't want to miss out even on their second or third stay in some of those um, major hubs, you can easily build an itinerary that goes in a different direction. For example, if you want to fly into Tokyo, have your big city experience again, You can head up north, go to Tochigi Prefecture, to places like Nikko. So that's a great area for um, people who are interested in Buddhism. It's got gorgeous temple and shrine complexes. The north of Japan is also known for its rice cultivation. And where you get really nice rice, you get really nice sake. Yeah, you knew where I was going with that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so great place to visit breweries, enjoy the beautiful nature there. Um, Or if, say, you're starting off in Osaka, Um, I often recommend people um, travel west to the Seto Uchi area. So that's basically all the prefectures by that inland sea that separates the mainland from Shikoku, which is the little island down south. Um, Mm -hmm. Lots of really incredible food there um, because it's bracketed with mountains and farmland and oceans. So you kind of get a lot of culinary bites from everything. Um, Great for nature lovers, for sports enthusiasts. I might be biased again because I did live there for okay. about four years. So, 
it might be showing there, but I often recommend people, you know, just pick a different direction and go with it. And there's an itinerary out there for you. Okay. So if you go further afield from the golden route, what's the Mm -hmm. easiest way to connect? Um, Now, I I don't know the name of all the islands, but either within the main island or going to the Northern Island or down to Okinawa, is it flying to the sort of the, the main hub of that particular island or region and then road or train? Yeah. So I would recommend, you know, if you want a quicker transfer, flying is an option that said you can take the bullet train. So if people really want to get good use out of their JR pass, um, they can easily access Kyushu as well as up north in Hokkaido. Um, You can get up there using the bullet train. Um, But of course, to get to somewhere like Okinawa, you'll want to take a flight. The ferry does take quite a while. Although if people want that scenic journey, by all means. It's there. Yeah. So just on that note, how does a, for want of a better word, a train pass work? in Japan. So if you're traveling independently or you want to travel independently after an organized itinerary and you're Mm -hmm. going to utilize the trains, what's the best ticket? Like, how does that work? Um, So it does depend on where you plan to go. So for people who do want to kind of do long distance travel, um, go to different regions throughout Japan, um, we often do recommend the Japan Rail Pass or the JR Pass. Um, So that is the countrywide pass. Basically, you pay a flat rate um, for a set period of time, whether it's 7, 14 or 21 days. And it allows unlimited rides on all JR lines. So that includes the bullet train as well as limited express and local lines, JR buses, even a ferry around Hiroshima is technically JR. You can take that too. Okay. Um, So that's really um, built, I would say, for people who are doing a lot of travel, doing a lot of day trips. Um, That said, if you are only staying in a specific region, say you want to travel around Kyushu only after you know, your other itinerary, you can get a Kyushu pass in the country. And so that'll be a cheaper option that allows you travel all around that region. Um, so you can either go with the regional passes or the overall JR pass, which right. I think the latter kind of takes the headache out of the travel because you just Fair show enough. it and you're on your way. Okay. And those passes can be like um, economy or first class or business class. If you're in, like, there are different classes within the bullet trains as well. So there is the general kind of reserved seating, and then they also have the green car. So the green car is kind of, I would say, equivalent to business class. It's um, a little bit quieter, fewer seats in there. So you do have a bit more of a pleasant experience, although I've only ever taken the standard class and it's still very quiet, very smooth. Um, And then there are a couple lines um, that have the grand class, which is the first class experience, including the Hokuriku um, Shinkansen line that goes Um, sort of up central Japan, Um, but the green car is fabulous. Right. Due to the speed that the trains travel in Japan not being hugely big compared to, say, the US, Canada, Australia, Mm -hmm. from where I'm from, are there sleeper cars, like where you would sleep on the train overnight? Yep. Okay. Yeah, there are. Yes, absolutely. So it depends on where you're going, but there are certain sleeper cars that you can take. Yes. Okay. So all the trains on board would have Wi-Fi. It is Japan, of course. Uh, I, last time I went for the Shinkansen, I connected to Wi-Fi. I'm not sure if every single train oh, really? has it. Okay. Um, I, I would have to check with JR because, you know, they always update things constantly. Sure, sure. Um, but I was able to have Wi-Fi when I took the Shinkansen, um, when I was in Japan a few months ago. And that was, you know, a line that anyone can take. So, okay. um, definitely check, but, uh, I would be optimistic. Okay, cool. And just on that note, I have an email that came in prior to this webinar from one of our agents. Um, This is a thing about cost, so I'll wrap it in. Her question is, do most taxis accept credit cards? That's a good question. Um, I would have to check. Um, Some companies, especially stuff like, you know, um, taxis that you arrange in advance, um, a lot of those um, will potentially accept credit cards, but I I would definitely recommend having cash on you um, just because Japan is a very cash heavy society. You can use your credit card, of course, while you're in the country, um, but especially if you're venturing off um, the beaten path and kind of going to slightly more rural areas, um, a lot of them uh, may only accept cash. So it's always a good idea to have um, some amount of cash on you. Okay. And that's a pretty general um, suggestion by Goway. Mm-hmm. Big cities, no matter what country, 
pretty much everywhere you're going to take credit card, Apple Pay, et cetera. But once you get rural, you want to have local cash for the, the reasons that uh, Rose brought up. Um, the other question came off the back of that from our agent, uh, Rena. She's asking, are there any concerns with taking taxis? I think she's probably referring to safety, um, mm-hmm. but Japan's probably one of the safest countries in the world. Um, so I'll let you answer it, but I'm going to say no, there'd be no issues with taking taxis. From I, I would agree. You're not going to have um, any issues. I mean, taxis are... Um, all over the place in Japan. Uber is not really a big thing there. Oh, okay, um, I was going to ask that. So really it's yeah. a taxi over Uber. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you'll find in maybe very, very large cities, um, you might be able to get an Uber, but taxis are kind of the standard. Um, and they're very safe, very professional. Um, I've taken taxis every single time I've been in Japan. And just for safety in general, in Japan, you're going to find you're not going to have problems typically walking around. I mean, I, I've never felt safer walking around at night than in Japan. Yeah, I've, um, it's not so much a safety aspect, but just, I guess it reflects, it's an honesty thing, which Japan is also famous for years ago when I was traveling. I got off a bullet train, I can't remember where, big city, that much I remember, and the big train station, mm-hmm. walked all the way to my hotel, went to check in, realized I'd left my bag with all mm-hmm. my passport and information, or everything, cash, everything, on the bullet train. And I thought, because the bullet trains run so on time and bang, it was halfway across the country by the time I eventually walked all the way back to the train station uh, with no Japanese and very few people speaking English. I found an office and lo and behold, there was my bag sitting right there because they'd gone through the train every stop. They go through and do a quick clean check of the train and honesty, they brought it to an office. It was handed over. It was wonderful. So, yeah, um, in my limited experience compared to you, Roger, I was the same thing. I felt completely safe comfortable everywhere I was um, in Japan. It was awesome in that respect. No, it's uh, it's fabulous. Even when I um, lived in Okayama, when I was, you know, a teacher, you know, there, I remember there was a time where I dropped my wallet um, when I was boarding the tram. I just dropped it, I guess, on the street, got all the way to my apartment, realized it took the tram all the way back. And it was just sitting there waiting for me. No one picked go. it up or took it. And oh, then really? one time, I think I dropped my, um, just my commuter pass somewhere and then i got a letter uh in the mail from the local police station in that area saying hey we have your commuter pass and your starbucks card and all of that <laughs> if you want to come and get it Wonderful. you know it's absolutely fabulous yeah it is it's refreshing in that respect um okay so um when you tra- if you were to travel outside the golden route no okay back again Japan is known to be an expensive destination. I don't think there's any way around that. Was that still a current and fair statement, comparatively speaking to other countries? I would say it depends kind of, oh, you're saying inexpensive. No, or expensive. expensive. Is, expensive. Is expensive, yeah. So yes. it's interesting because I, I mean, I was in Japan for work just, you know, a couple months ago and <laughs> I've never spent less on things like, mm-hmm. you know, food and accommodations. So of course, if you're going in peak travel season, you are going to see hotel prices are increasing, yogan prices increasing. Um, but at the same time, right now, the exchange rate is really nice. Um, it's about 144 yen to the dollar last I checked, which is about... more that you're getting compared to the standard rate. Um, So things in general are just a lot cheaper than you would expect. Um, So if you're kind of just finessing with, say, accommodations, you want to stay at a nice hotel, it's quite pricey. Obviously, yeah, your your trip is going to go up. Um, But there are definitely ways to kind of finesse around it to make it work for sure. Okay. And I think one of those ways would be to eat locally as well, not expensive want to eat every night westernized food or western food if you're willing to eat local then like most countries it'll be much much cheaper as well is that also a fair statement yeah i mean just in general i found restaurants um in the different areas i was in are just way cheaper say a a kaisen donor like a seafood bowl with piled high with fresh raw seafood something that would be like forty dollars here in the states I can get there for 10 bucks, you know? Yeah. Um, just when you're eating the local specialties in the country, things are going to be um, cheaper. It's very refreshing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so we're sort of coming to the end of this now. Um, do you have any expert tip or 
something that the average person wouldn't think about when looking to Japan, when building mm-hmm. itinerary, or when they're there. Expert. It's hard because once you live there for a long time, it's hard to remember what's <laughs> yeah. considered expert <laughs> yeah, exactly. or not. I mean, I would say um, if you're taking the time to visit Japan, you know, there are very independent travelers, but a lot of people want to have activities arranged. They want things scheduled and that's really great. And it keeps things really seamless and smooth. But I personally think there's a really special freedom and kind of sense of wonder that comes from plopping yourself somewhere new, wandering around, taking, say, three or four hours of free time to just stumble on those little hole in the walls that you might not have found otherwise. Um, This applies as well, I guess, to when we were talking about um, staying in more rural areas. Um, You really get this salt of the earth experience, get to try local crafts, local cuisine, um, have these really authentic interactions with locals. And that's a great way, I think, to build immersion. Um, There are a lot of hidden gems like that all around Japan. They're easy to fit um, into an itinerary, even if you're sticking um, to the golden route, just taking a day trip out. Um, I would say don't be wary of treading off the beaten path. Um, It's accessible and it's very rewarding. Excellent. I think that's great uh, great advice as well from, from the experience that you can find, stumble across, as you say, but also when you're building an itinerary. um, I know a lot of people don't have a lot of time and they want to get as much in as they can, but build in a day or two to just explore, not sit in a hotel and relax, just to write, today is a free day, but I'm going to catch a train somewhere or just walk around certain suburbs of Tokyo or Osaka or whatever it may be. And because that's where I found in my travel history too, that it's when you least expect it, you probably have or come across what end up being the best memories of the place you've just visited. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, we've had a pretty bumpy four or five years with a whole lot of things happening and shutting the world down, let alone countries. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned last year, and we've seen it here, everyone's getting back out there. You know, the term that was being thrown around was called revenge travel after being locked up for a couple of years. Um, 2023 was busy for everyone because of that. Um, you mentioned Mount Fuji was at capacity because you had a backlog of people wanting to visit. So how is 2024 looking for Japan and beyond? Like what's happening on the horizon in regards to tourism, new opportunities, new product, et cetera? Right. There's a lot. So actually it was just announced, I think last month, maybe a little a little earlier that 2024 is the official US Japan travel year. Um, by both respective governments, both Japan and the US. So the kind of the goal there is restore and expand exchange between the two countries. So it's a really exciting time to be visiting Japan, lots of new hotels um, that are opening, Um, also the new revamped Team Labs border list. So that is, you might be familiar, that um, interactive kind of light museum. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. All over social media, um, very, very popular. It's been under construction um, for uh, the last couple of years. People have been going to sort of the sister museum um, in the meantime, but that's opening in February in Tokyo. So um, very high in demand. So it's a great time to visit. Universal Studios uh, Japan and Osaka is expanding their park in 2024. We've got Um, I think now 17 new Michelin star restaurants in Tokyo. Um, So there's a lot. Coming up in 2025 as well, we have the um, Osaka, the um, World Expo that's going to be happening. That has quite a lot of projected visitors. It'll be going on for about six months. Um, So lots to look forward to, and we're really excited for people to come see it all. Um, So another bit of housekeeping I didn't touch on was, uh, do Americans and or Canadians need a visa to visit Japan? So... um, Essentially, your passports have a built-in visa, so you are allowed up to 90 days um, stay in Japan for tourism, business, that sort of thing, any non-remunerative activities. Um, you're good to go. Okay, so pretty much standard uh, worldwide. That's good to hear. So even easier, direct flights, no visas, easy peasy. Okay, so that's it for our questions today. If anyone out there has any other questions that we didn't touch on, uh, you can reach out to uh, GoAway. Um, info at goaway.com or you can reach out uh, maybe not directly to Rose but definitely to the Japan National Tourism Organization or Rose do you have an email that people if they want to get some collateral 
off you or have some more detailed questions. Mind you, we can answer all of them here at Goway, but still, mm -hmm. so I may wish to contact you directly for other reasons. Sure. You want to give us an email address, please? Yeah, sure. So I'll give you two. So there's the main info line for um, the Los Angeles office. Um, so that is info, L-A-X, at J-N-T-O dot go dot J-P. Um, my email is rose underscore Lifshitz, as you see here on the screen, um, at jnto.go.jp. And we also do have an office in Toronto and in New York. Um, so if you're in different territories, you can always reach out to those different offices. Okay, I'll um, try and dig up the contact information for those two offices and throw it up on the screen uh, for those that are watching this now as well. Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for listening in today and obviously I'd like to thank Rose for her time um, and her very in-depth knowledge. You can see um, from her time, literally in Japan, she knows what she's talking about, um, which is what this series is all about, the industry insiders. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, if you do have any other questions about Japan itself, itinerary construction, anything, please reach out to us at Goway, info at goway.com for that, uh, any detailed information, um, and if you want any, I guess, um, collateral for travel shows or anything, Rose, I can approach the JNTO for that, any type of literature that agents may want. Yeah, so um, if you do want any more information, so our website is um, a really, really great resource. It's just japan.travel, so very, very easy to remember. Um, we've got breakdowns about, you know, first time visitors, what they need to know, um, if they need to prepare anything. Uh, we have breakdowns of different prefectures and within those cities and different areas, neighborhoods, things to do, different guides, different experiences. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. Um, but of course, if you ever have any questions about Japan, you're more than welcome to reach out. And on that uh, vein, uh, go away, of course, through its go away pro travel Academy. Uh, we have a, uh, a course on Japan, which covers a lot of what we discussed today, everything from getting there, visas, everything like that. Uh, so to access that, if you're not a member of our academy, you can go to gowayagent.com, sign in or create a login at, at that website, and then you can delve into the Japan LMS module, as we call it, hosted by yours sincerely, Mr. Professor Goway. Um, and that's really useful particularly if you're a first time to Japan. It's got all the core information you need to, to get going. So, Rose, thank you very much. Do appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for logging in and listening today. And we will see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cool. That's it. Okay.